welcome back to another Netgear Insider webinar. I'm your host, Sarah Moreno. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. We're excited to have you. Today we'll be talking about advanced VLAN setup. And here to discuss this topic today with us is Shavi, our product line manager for switches and our switch expert. <laughs> hey, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Um, if you have any questions, during the webinar, please feel free to ask them in the chat room below. We'll get to as many as we can during the webinar, and if not, then we'll hold those to the end, towards the end. And that is it for now. So, Shavi, take it away. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Sarah. So, let's start. So, yeah, that's myself. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Shavi Leisha. Uh, I'm the PLM here at Netgear for switching in Manage and Plus. Um, I joined Netgear uh, 10 years ago almost, and I was working as a sales engineer yeah, across the world, more or less, in EMEA and in APAC. Uh, yeah, and I love the speed. So Tangic are my favorite products. So today we are going to cover uh, the advanced VLAN setup. So what we are going to uh, do in terms of the agenda is going to be we are going to do an intro about why we need the villains, why they are important. We are going to talk about the basic villains. This is uh, like just uh, as a reminder, we did a webinar um, a couple of months ago about the basic villains. So we, we have to kind of do like a summary up to get the speed uh, into the villain. So everybody is aligned and we know like at least the uh, main uh, terminology, but later on we're going to jump uh, to the advanced villain setting. So mainly what we are going to cover today is uh, we want that you guys you have a better understanding about the layer three and the ACL uh, features. So uh, this is when we are talking about advanced villains, and that's what we are going to cover today about the layer three and the ACL. We're gonna see also like a product uh, portfolio. So which products are the, the best fit in terms of advanced VLANs when you need to configure it. And to finish, we are gonna do a Q&A session. So um, as uh, Sarah said, like feel free to ask us any question that you have about VLANs or about anything. We will try to, to cover all of them uh, by the end of the webinar and if some of the questions are really relevant to what we're talking. Uh, I will try to cover uh, at the same time. So, um, so saying that, I think that's time to start. So thanks again, guys, for joining this webinar. Let's go for the introduction. So uh, in terms of the introduction, the first thing that I want to highlight to everybody is, well, we changed, uh, like the world is changing. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to put like uh, three scenarios on your uh, left side. So just let me point, uh, use the pointer one second, the spotlight. Yeah. So here is the voice networks that we used to have. We also used to have the, uh, sorry, one second. We also used to have the, um, uh, the video networks and the data networks. So that's probably something like 10 years, well, five years ago, it, it used to be the normal configuration, but now all of these, they move to one big converged network. This is the all-in-one network. That's the, where we put like in one switch, we connect cameras, we connect phones, we connect access points, and now we are expanding with the IoT, we are connecting door controllers, POS terminals, RFID readers. So. The number of devices that we are connected to the network are growing and growing. However, not all of them, they have the same needs. So for example, if I am talking guys right now, and I have like a network where we have like packet drops, well, my communication will be uh, really uh, bad because I going to have like uh, breaking the voice, I gonna have issues, uh, just if I got like packet drops or a higher latency. However, if I am in a, uh, in a data network, I can send an email and if it takes one second more, nobody will realize that uh, I have an issue. So 
the requirements of each network are also different. So that's why it's really important that when we put all this network together, that's really cool, really good, because we can have like one infrastructure that supports multiple networks, that's perfect. But we need to take in consideration what are the main requirements of the different networks. For example, the other area that you guys know that it's really growing, and that's something that changes a lot, that changed a lot in the last years, is the access layer. So in the past, most of the devices, uh, it used to access the network via a wired connectivity. Right now, look at yourself. How many uh, wireless devices you have? I am sure now most of you guys are connected via Wi-Fi with your laptop, your, with your uh, phone, with your tablet. Same as us here. We are doing the webinar. We, we are in a conference room. We are using Wi-Fi as a main access layer. So uh, that's also important, but sometimes we, we mix the Wi-Fi on the wired network. However, that's, uh, they are really different. Why they are really different? So first, the Wi-Fi will have high interference. So we know that it's gonna be uh, the, affected by the channels, the noise that could be around. We have shared media on the Wi-Fi and a dedicated media on the wired. And one of the things that, that's the reason that I highlighted in red is that the Wi-Fi network is a broadcast. So what does it mean is that, for example, when we say that a switch is a gigabit switch, we have eight port gigabit. Each port can deliver one gigabit per port. In Wi-Fi, we have an access point and we say, hey, this is a 11 AC, 1.2 gigabit per second. That's the aggregated bandwidth. So if we have 10 clients, we have to divide it by 10. And that's only like the the physical speed. So we know that in Wi-Fi, we have almost like 50% of that. So uh, they are really different. So we don't, we should not mix them. We should like really isolate them in terms of uh, performance. Otherwise, one network will be affecting uh, the other one. The other uh, area that we really need to uh, control is threats. As you know, guys, for example, a few weeks ago, uh, we most of the networks worldwide were affected by the um, by the WannaCry um, ransomware. So you know one of the main issues with a uh, ransomware or any other threat is that once you affect one device in the network, you are able um, you are able to uh, now go to other computers in the same network. So what happens is that once you are able to be inside uh, the network, you start infecting all your different computers. So that imagine like uh, if you are, as we highlighted in the beginning, if you have phones, cameras, all of them mixed, uh, you can like hijack from, the, uh, from your computer. You can hijack, for example, the phone system. And that's currently happened. So now you know what is one of the strategies of the hackers is not going through the computer space. They know that the IoT devices, they have lower security levels. So they try to hijack first one of these IoT devices because for example, some of them, they don't even use encrypted passwords. So they hijack, for example, the camera that you have in your network. But if you don't have villains, once they hijack your camera, they are, already in your network so they can access to all your network. So we just got like a uh, really yeah. good question. We got, a, we got a question from Edward. Can you differentiate between shared and dedicated media? Yeah, that's the thing. What we can really differentiate when we are talking about shared media and dedicated media is uh, about uh, how the, the, the throughput is isolated. So when we are, it's like just to say an analogy, this is kind of a, uh, if we are in a motorway and we have different uh, speed lanes or we are only, or we only have one lane. So the share media is, we only have one lane in the Wi-Fi. It all, everybody, if I send in packets, all of them goes through the same one. So we have like control mechanisms to get access to this media. That's the share media. However, the dedicated media is like, we have one lane for each port. So, if I want to access the network, I can have direct access to that one. So yeah, it's comparing like going to uh, one <laughs> lane, 
uh, motorway to like multiple lanes here. So that could be like one comparison that we can use. So going back to the threat, uh, as I said, like uh, we can, ha uh, we, we have to make sure we implement security on this threat. Uh, the, another way that we can test it, as we highlighted in our previous webinar, is that without VLANs, I can see everybody in my network. With VLANs, I only see the devices that are attached to my network. So that's uh, the security improvement. We were going to talk about this later on in this advanced VLAN webinar, but that's uh, like the introduction of VLANs is performance, security, uh, and scalability are the main reasons to implement VLANs in any network. And right now, should be mandatory for almost all the different networks where we are. So let's start for the VLAN concept that we want to highlight. So first of all, what's the VLAN? So that's a switch. So that's a four port switch. Unfortunately, we have five, eight, you know, 16, 24, 48. But to make it easier, I just draw four. So <laughs> that was the reason. So what the switch has inside is this MAC address table. So for example, I have four computers, A, B, C, and D. And what I have, each switch, it has kind of like an ID. It's, it's sa the same thing as, the, for example, uh, an ID card or the social ID. It has a unique identifier. So each computer has this unique identifier, and the switch got this table. So by default, any device that you connect to the switch, they are able to communicate to each other. So when computer A sends a packet, to computer B, as they are in the same switch, they can talk. It's, it's okay. I, uh, it, it, there is communication between them. However, when we implement VLANs, we added this extra uh, column here. So you can see we have um, VLAN 1 and VLAN uh, 2. So when, for example, when computer A wants to talk to computer B, as they are in different broadcast domains, when they send a packet, the computer B will never get it. So the VLANs is kind of like a having different switch. So it's how we segment the, the network. So instead of implementing two different switches, uh, we have one switch but, uh, that we share physically, the ports, but logically, they are isolated. So logically, it's, uh, having this four port switch is the same as having two switches with two ports uh, connected. So that's how VLANs works internally. So whenever you want to check if the VLAN works properly, you have to understand like what's the MAC address in which VLAN are located, so you can understand if it's gonna be like any, um, any restriction here. What the, uh, before yeah. you move on, uh, David asked, uh, what tools are available or do you recommend to identify how much bandwidth is being used by each VLAN? Well, there are like a few tools here, David. Uh, I would recommend like, for example, in our switches, we have a feature that's called for mirroring. And normally the switches goes like all, almost all the traffic goes to the uplinks. So what we recommend if you want to identify how much bandwidth are you using per VLAN is you can uh, have like a packet sniffer and analyze the traffic per VLAN. The other way is that we offer, uh, that could be like another topic for another webinar, but we also, some of our switches implement diff serve and you can uh, have flow control per VLAN. So you can implement bandwidth limitation per VLAN if you wish. And the latest one is uh, to have SNMP and some of our, for example, NMS systems that go give you like the bandwidth uh, per the different ports and in the VLANs, you can set up the VLAN routing port. So three different ways. SNMP, one way. Second way, the port mirroring with Wireshark or any packet sniffer. And the third uh, way that you can really like look at the um, uh, bandwidth traffic is also looking at the port. So um, what else we should know about the um, uh, uh, what else we should know about the um, uh, different access and transports? So yeah, we, we are gonna cover like, if you guys have any 
extra questions or if you want that I go deeper in any of the questions, we are going to cover it at the end. So that's just like uh, getting some points on, on this one. So, <laughs> and so the type of course that's really important to understand how VLAN works. So as we saw in the first slide, we configure the port to belong to each VLAN. But what happens when we want to extend the network? So for example, what happens when I want to connect switch one to switch two. Which port this, uh, which, which VLAN this port should um, belong? So it should be like VLAN, uh, data VLAN, should be Wi-Fi VLAN. So here we want to introduce a new concept that's called uh, the trunk and the access port. So when we are interconnecting switches and we have uh, different um, when we have different like switches connected between them, we have these trunk ports. So these trunk ports are ports that belongs to multiple villains. And where we can find trunk ports? So for example, in a switch to switch uh, configuration, in a switch to switch link, we are using normally trunk ports. But for example, when we are connecting to a phone. There are some times that we are using trunk ports. Why we are using a trunk port when we are connecting a phone? Because normally we can have this setup as we see here. We have a computer that works in the data VLAN, but the voice, the, the, the phone uh, is connected to this computer at the same, and at the same time it's connected to the switch. So the link between the switch and the phone needs to carry like the voice for the phone and the data for the computer. So in this case, we need this as a trunk. And the other one that it's commonly using as a trunk is the access point. Because for example, if we have a Wi-Fi VLAN and a data VLAN, a two SSIDs, that's a normal case because sometimes we want a private VLAN. So when the Wi-Fi guys are connected, they can see my servers and everything. But we also want a gas network. So when we have the gas network, we just want to get access to the internet, for example. So we need two VLANs here. So as this port will carry on a couple of VLANs, we need to configure this port as a trunk port. So that's um, what uh, we really want to highlight here is the difference between the trunk and the access. So trunk are ports that carries more than one villain. And access are ports where we only carry one villain. So for example, if I have just one computer, that this computer will belong to the data villain, uh, that's gonna be an access port. So that's just access. Same thing as a server. So if it's only like access port, it only belongs to one villain, it's only uh, access port. So we, we need to think about uh, when we are implementing VLANs, how we are going to configure it. Because one of the common uh, issues that we find uh, when people are implementing VLAN is that they set up uh, the VLANs in one switch, the VLANs in the other switch, but they cannot carry on the VLANs across the switches. And the most common issue is because they don't set up a trunk. So uh, that's really important in terms of setting up the trunk ports uh, between the different switches. So that's the second com uh, concept that I wanted to highlight. So remember uh, how VLAN works about the MAC address table and the access and trunk ports. And the third point is that, okay, now we have a switch like this, a beautiful uh, 24 port switch where I want to implement three VLANs. So I, I, I put some colors here. So the red ones are the VLAN, the data VLAN, for example, the blue ones are the access VLANs, and the green uh, ones could be our, uh, for example, data center. Okay, so as we highlighted, the VLANs is kind of isolating the ports. So these four ports, they can talk to each other. These blue ports can talk to each other, and these green ports can talk to each other. However, look at this sign, it's top. So what we really want to highlight here is that when, when we are implementing VLANs in layer two, something that we are missing is the communication between these, uh, for example, this, this computer with this server. So 
and for like that was the main purpose of the village. So what we want is to isolate this uh, traffic. So we don't want that, uh, as we highlighted at the beginning, we don't want that somebody who uh, has access to my guest network can hijack my data network. However, there are some cases that we need this intercommunication. For example, let's say that I install a soft phone in my computer. So I need to talk to the PBX. I need to talk to the uh, cloud PBX or to the physical PBX in my network. So how can I do it? That's one issue that normally could happen. Second issue that could happen is, for example, it's quite common, is that, uh, yeah, I have a gas villain, and I want that the gas villain also access to the internet. So where I should put my router? Should I put my router in the blue or in the, or in the green? But if I put in the green, the, let's say that the green now is the gas villain, yeah, my computers cannot access to internet. I don't want that. But if I put in the blue, my guest network will not be able to access the internet. So yeah, as you can see, there is still some issues with this layer to villain configuration. That's what we want to talk today is how we can, uh, how we can enable this communication between villains. So that in order to solve this, we need to introduce a new concept. This new concept is called routing. So that's, uh, that's the next step in terms of the VLAN. So VLAN routing is what we are going to talk today. So as we said before, like uh, we can have these VLANs segregated. So we have the red uh, ports in one VLAN. We have the blue ports in another VLAN and the green ports in another VLAN. So we can have different ways to perform this routing. I can add if I want an external router. So I can add this external router, one, one router, and I can have like a one port that is in the green VLAN and another port in the red. And the router will route between these two VLANs. That's, that's one way to do it. That's one way to solve this issue in terms of the inter-VLAN communication. Uh, that's one of the um, uh, ways to solve it, however, this uh, router, we have to make sure that uh, they are powerful enough. Otherwise, the CPU load can cause the bottleneck because now all the traffic that normally goes into the switches that we have specific hardware to do the switching now goes to the router. So that could have impact into our performance. And now what we added is like the second way to solve it is that we have a switch, but the switch inside the switch, we have a router. That's what we call layer three switches. And that's what we call um, the L3 routing. So when you see like a switch that it says it has L2 plus, L3 or routing capabilities, they are referring the same thing. We, they are referring that we are adding a router into the switch. So that's what we really are doing with the L3 capabilities. So the good news of using this uh, router in uh, inside the switch is that this is really a uh, high performance because at the end we are using our uh, hardware to do all the routing. So it's kind of like uh, uh, same speed as, as the switching. So we don't have the bottlenecks as a normal router can do it because it used the ASIC chips to do that. So it's more like terms of performance, what we are achieving with this uh, router inside the switch. But let's look inside the switch and how we should do it, because now we are adding a little bit of complexity in terms of uh, the network design. So when we talk about the network design using layer three switches, uh, what we are, for example, let's see, let's have a look into this uh, network design. We have different villains. So we have a curriculum servers, we have the admin servers, we have printers, we have staff, we have students, and we have internet. So we have different villains to simulate a normal SMB environment. That could be voice, video. We can like we can use uh, whatever you guys you, you would like to use. So we can use any villain. A configuration that you prefer. However, the first thing that we have to notice is that we need to change 
the different uh, IP address. So each VLAN has to have a different IP address. So here, for example, we're using 10s, 20s. Uh, the reality is that we should use private VLANs, but that's an example. So I just wanted to highlight. So the private VLANs, remember, uh, the 192.168, the 10.000, the 172.16, so the 172.32. That's the ones that we are using. We shouldn't use public IP address, OK? But for example, if curriculum servers is 192.168.10 and server is 20, that's the way that we have to do it. So we have to, to first, before we implement it, because you know, uh, changing IP address thing is not easy. Once you implemented the current IP addressing, changing it, it's quite difficult. But if you do it from scratch, it's easy. You know, like, well, I want to bring a new IP phone system in my network. I just uh, set it up with an IP address range, and that's, uh, that's it, it's easy. But once the network is ready, change it to the uh, different IP address, it's hard. So first advice, make sure that you plan it properly. Make sure that you plan the, to use the IP address schema from the beginning. Uh, the second one is that, uh, yeah, we, we, we covered that one before. Security is the key. Uh, at the end, we need to implement security when we are doing VLANs, uh, when we are doing like different VLANs um, in our network. However, as we said, like if we put routing, we are enabled now the traffic going from one VLAN to another. However, in order to filter it, that's something that we are going to see before. We, we can use something that's the advanced filters. So that's what we want to use. We want to use these advanced filters to uh, filter how, for example, the curriculum, uh, how the students can access the curriculum servers, if they can. <laughs> and so let's go a little bit deeper in this uh, concept. I know that's kind of like, a, uh, I will say, a step up from the basic VLAN, because now we're talking about routing and IP addressing and can be a little bit complicated. But let's, let me go through the next slides where we are going to see how the traffic flows. So let's go to the, well, uh, before we go to that one, just wanted to highlight, in order to make it easier, what we did is we have a wizard call in our switches. So if you go to our switches, you're going to see like the switches that supports L3 routing, you're going to see a tab that's called routing. So this tab that's called routing, in, in one step, you are able to configure uh, everything that's required. Okay, so that's the beautiful of the, um, of this VLAN wizard config. So how it works, you create a VLAN ID. So we need to set up if it's VLAN 10, 20. At the end, the name of the VLAN doesn't matter. What it really matters is the, the ID, the number, because it's the way that we intercommunicate between the switches. We assign an IP address to the VLAN. So this is the IP address to the VLAN that we assign. And, and as you can see, the subnet. So now the switch will have multiple IP addresses. So for example, here, as you can see, this switch has the 10, 10, 10.1, 20, 20, 20 .1, 60, 60, 60.1. So each uh, VLAN has their own IP address in the switch. So the switch, uh, it's able to talk to each VLAN with a different IP address. So that's another thing that we have to highlight. And to finish, we can configure the access or the transport. So if I uh, click once, it will appear a U. That means an access port or untag and a T for a VLAN that will mean that's a tag or tag port. So in just one configuration slide uh, and one step, using the VLAN routing wizard, you're going to be able to set it up the different VLANs, enable the routing. If, we, if you don't use this one, that's uh, kind of like a six step. So that's a good tool to use. Remember, when you go to routing, you have this VLAN routing wizard going to save time. Xavi, uh, can yeah, you? Sarah, can you please? Know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Igor is asking, can you please explain the correlation between tagged and untagged VLANs and PVIDs and how to set PVIDs up? Yeah, let's go. I haven't like a go deeper in this webinar. Uh, when we finish, I will send, we will send it to you guys also the previous webinar where we 
when defined in terms of uh, ANTAC, ANTAC, and the PV ideas, but uh, just uh, in order to summarize it uh, in an easy way, uh, so first we, we can cover the TAC and ANTAC. So we have to think in, in two ways. First is the outgoing traffic. So when a packet is going from uh, the switch, it's outgoing to the uh, it, it's it, it's outgoing from the Ethernet port. So when the traffic is outgoing from the Ethernet port, uh, if we put a U that's an untag, it means that we don't add any information into this. Uh, we don't tag this packet. And we, when we put a tag, it means that we tag this packet. So why this why this is necessary? So for example, let's say that this computer here that's in the access VLAN wants to communicate to the access VLAN. So what we do is that this computer sends an untagged packet from the access because uh, it's an, this, this computer is access port. It's an untagged packet. So when it arrives the switch, it sends it out from this trunk port. But in this trunk port, we need to identify. We need to, in somehow, tag this, port, uh, tag this packet to identify that the uh, that's a data bill. Otherwise, when the, uh, when this uh, sorry when this packet will arrive here, we will know that's a tag packet because it comes target and it will send to the access bill. So that's why we need the tag into the trunk. So trunk it means that we need to tag the port because we need to identify an untag. It means that we don't need to identify. So for example, when this packet sends out to this computer, we don't need to tag it. It only belongs to the access, so that should be untagged. The, the, the switch inside will automatically uh, know that the port where this computer is connected is an access port and the packet is for that because it knows the MAC address and will send it the untagged packet. So untagged and tagged packets are related to the outgoing traffic from the port. And um, PBIDs, the uh, PVIDs are related to the incoming traffic. So, to the incoming traffic, when the switch, for example, when this switch, when this uh, computer uh, sends a packet to, to here, to this switch, in which VLAN this uh, computer will belong? Because this uh, computer, you know, like if you don't, you will not configure any VLAN setting or anything in the computer. You don't. You, you just like plug it in and automatically. Be a, gonna be assigned to VLAN. So how does it work? So the way that it works is that this computer will assign the uh, port related into the PVID. So when the uh, when this uh, packet comes into the switch, the PVID, the service, the data VLAN will be assigned this packet to this PVID. So as a summary, for access port, you have to use untag and the PVID. That, uh, that's uh, on the bill. For trunk ports, you need to use tag. So that's, as a summary, what we need to do between the untag and tag and the PBAD. So that's like the, the summary about the tags and untag. <laughs> and so going back to the um, uh, routing, uh, because uh, that's what we really want to focus on today. So. We created the VLAN, so we create this schema here, so the different VLANs with the different IP networks and everything. So now let's understand how it works. So understand first the traffic flow. So let me show it to you guys first. Uh, I want uh, to communicate between the, uh, the device A that's here, that has an IP address of the 30, 30, 30, 100, and a device B that's also in the student's VLAN with the IP address of 30, 30, 30, 200. So how does it work? Uh, first, as both of them, they belong to the same VLAN, the traffic uh, will go directly from A to B directly, and the traffic gonna go back from B to A directly because both of them, they are in the same VLAN. So that's how the in VLAN communication will work. Second uh, scenario, we are gonna now check how the traffic will work between a computer that's in the student's VLAN and one server that's in the curriculum server. So as you can see, it's the, this uh, student 
computer got the 30, 30, 30 dot 100 um, IP address, and the curriculum server got the 10, dot 10, dot 10, dot 200. So how it's gonna work? So the first thing is that computer A wants to talk to this IP, the 10, dot 10, dot 10, dot 200. So as it does, as it's not in their subnet. So yeah, as you can see, that's the 30 and that's the 10. So it's not in the subnet. We need to use the gateway. So the gateway in this case, in this case, is the 30, 30, 30, dot one. This is our switch. This is our switch with the router inside. So the first packet gonna go to our switch. So we will uh, send the packet to the gateway, the 30, 30, 30, dot one. And when the uh, Packet will arrive to this uh, to, to our switch. Our switch will check what's the destination IP address. So the destination IP address is 10.10.10.200. So as uh, the 10.10.200 is here, it's in this VLAN. Uh, we will send the packet to this VLAN and we'll reach the curriculum server. However, when we are working with IP flows it's important that we also consider the uh, way back. You know, when you do a ping, you, you do like a ping uh, that's a, a echo and you get the reply. So always we need to consider the way back. So what happens when this guy wants to get it back to this computer? Same thing, it's coming, he sees that the packet coming from the 303030 uh, IP address and uh, that's not in their subnet, so he needs to use the gateway. So he sends the packet back to the gateway that in this case is the switch with the router inside. And same process here, the router check it out, the packet is in the 3030.100 in this VLAN, and the, um, and the router, the switch, sorry, <laughs> the switch router sends the packet back to the computer A. So, this is the second scenario. So now you know when you're doing like um, inter VLAN communication, all the traffic goes through the uh, switch because uh, you, through the router, because through the router inside the switch, because you need to intercommunicate them. And the third scenario is that what happened with the internet communication? So how we communicate with internet? So you know we have our switch with routing capabilities, but we have another router. So let's say that this uh, student computer now wants to talk to a server that's in internet with the IP address 8788A. So how does it work? So I send a packet from the IP address, 30, uh, uh, same thing, I check it, this IP address is not in my subnet, no, it's different, this is the 30, this is 8, so it's different. I send it to my gateway, 30, 30.1. Same thing here, the switch will check it, it's not here, 8.8, eight, eight. I don't have any 8 here, so I don't know where this packet goes. So what I do is I send it to my default gateway, that's the router, and this, this sends it to the router, and the router sends it to internet, and the ISP and everything will make it happen to reach the IP address of the server. However, as I said, we also have to consider way back. So when the packet goes back, this goes back and send the packet back from the A to 70 to this computer. So when this, com when this packet reach the um, uh, router, we need, this router needs to know where is the 30, 30, 30, or one. As you guys see, it's not here, it's not connected to them because he only has the 50. So he has to know that he has to send it back to the, our switch router and the switch router has to send it back to the A. That's crucial. That's when I see most of the issues in network implementations is because sometimes this guy here, the router that has internet access, doesn't know how to get it back to the 30. So that's uh, why we really need to understand these traffic flows. So that's how we want to work the internet communication with the inter -villain settings. And now that we set up all this routing and all, now everything runs and everything works well, however, you're gonna say, Xavi, so we already got it, like if we put like everything in just one VLAN, uh, we also have communication between everybody and we don't have to, to be worried about like all these like 
segmenting VLANs and stuff like that, because at the end, everybody can see everybody. So that's why it's important the next step. So when, every time that we implement routing, we have to implement IP ICLs or ICLs in general. So what's the ICL? So now our switch just gets more powerful. We used to have a router, and now it has even a firewall inside. So that's what is the IP ICLs. So that's now the router, uh, the switch. It's a switch, it's a router, and it's a firewall in the same switch. So why we want this uh, IP ICL? So we want it because we want to control the traffic flows. Because we want to also establish that I don't want the students can access the curriculum server. That looks dangerous. Like imagine that your students are able to change their own marks, that's not good. <laughs> so we want to filter that one, or for example, between boys or whatever, but we want this control. So how uh, I can implement this control? The only thing that we need to consider is that in the past, I said, no worries, the switch is great. When we do routing, no impact on the performance because we use the ASIC, so we do it great. However, when we do ACLs, well, yeah, ACLs impact on the performance. Okay, so because they are analyzing all the packets. So we need to like try to get it as close as we can to the access switch. So uh, that's normally what we really want. So when we have a network with access and core switches, the ACLs as close as we can implement it to the access, better gonna be because the core should be focusing in doing all the high performance. So in terms of the ACLs, we have two types of ACLs. We can do ACLs on Mac, so access control is, we can do MAC access control is, or we can do IP base. And in IP base, we have two types, the standards and extenders. So standards only look in the IP source and extender look into the IP source and destination base. So basically, we need to be focused here, extended IP ACLs. And again, we try to make your life easier here at Netgear, and we create an ACL with our config that also gonna help you a lot to implement the different villains that you want. So we select the ACL type that we want. So for example, ACL based on the destination and the port, and we create the rule. So the rule can be uh, uh, access port 80 from the student's villain, and we configure the building. I will not go deeper because it will take us like half an hour, but just to let you know, like an example of an IP ACL rule created. So for example, permit, uh, here uh, we pull like the uh, deny, the, sorry, the traffic that's coming for an ICMP. So for example, we are uh, just getting, uh, we are just filtering the ping traffic in the uh, ACL. And we can implement these rules in the VLAN ACL. So that's what I wanted to highlight in terms of the feature set, the routing and the ACLs. We are going to do more webinars talking about that so we can go deeper just to how to configure the routing and how to configure the ACLs. Um, but just before we finish, just uh, going to give you like an update in terms of the product line and where we should start looking onto the product. So we have unmanaged switches. Unmanaged switches, you don't manage it, so plug and play, don't, you cannot use VLANs or anything here. And manage flat switches, uh, first ones where we have VLANs, the smart switches, the ones that we have, the routing. So here's where we start routing on ACLs and manage switches. So when we are talking about advanced VLANs, we have to go with smart and manage. And preferably, managed switches would be like the best one. So just in one slide, all the portfolio and manage, web manage, smart manage, and fully manage. So just to let you know, yeah, as you can see here, static routing and advanced security start in smart manage and fully managed. So that's the products for static routing and uh, ACLs. If we just want uh, VLANs, basic VLANs, um, and we just want like segment the traffic, the web managed VLANs, uh, the web managed features are, are the good ones. So uh, I know that we have a few questions that we are going to cover right now. So Sarah, can you let us know what are these exciting questions that we yeah, have? Yeah, really quick. Um, can you go back to the managed switch slide? Yeah. This one? Yeah, just yeah. so they can view it. Okay. 
So we have a question from Scott. What is the difference between general and access in the M4300 switch? General and access uh, in the M4300 switch? You mean in terms of the configuration, Scott? Uh, because I'm not sure if I understand the question about the general and access on the M4300. Uh, the M4300 is our fully managed switches and uh, the access, I think that you are referring for the configuration. So we have two configuration sites on the M4300. Um, and in the, the M4300 access, you can use this um, untag, tag, and PPID setup. Uh, and in the general, you can use the um, trunk and access uh, setup. So it's two different ways to configure the VLANs in this case. We recommend to use the um, access and trunk. It's easier if you, if you want. Okay. And then Bob is asking, if you add routing for a workstation VLAN to talk to the server VLAN, what happens to the security or separation? Which was the reason for the VLAN? Sorry. Uh, if you add routing for a workstation VLAN to talk to the server VLAN, what happens to security or separation? Ah, okay, yeah, that's, uh, Bob, that was one of the areas where we were covering this one. So. When you added the, the routing, you add the communication. So we add, you add all the traffic that can flow. So you don't have any security implemented. You just isolate the, the broadcast, but everybody can talk to everybody. That's the reason that when you implement routing, you have to also implement IP ICLs. That's the, that's the firewall that you control, like how like the um, workstation VLAN can talk to the server, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, is it difficult to remove VLAN one as managed VLAN, or changing the VLAN from one? The M forty one hundred S thirty three. Oh yeah, changing. That's uh, if you guys you want to go up in terms of security. That's a good practice to remove the VLAN one of the management VLAN because that's the VLAN uh, the default VLAN. Uh, for all our um, products. So it's not difficult. We have, if you go into the switch, you have the switch, the IP management, and you just need to change the IP management VLAN to another one. And in the M4300, the new ones, we make it even easier. So you can uh, just select uh, the VLAN that is the management VLAN at any time. The only consideration is that yeah, when you change management VLAN, you have to be uh, cautious because at the end, you remember, if you change the villain, as you see, like before, when, when we are isolating the ports, it works really well. I mean, when you do like that, that you isolate the port, it works really well. It, 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 as soon as you change the villain, you lose the access. So that's the thing. If you, for example, you change the management villain to villain 50 and you, you don't have any port configured to access to villain 50, that's uh, when you can have issues. So when you are changing the VLAN, uh, the default VLAN, make sure you have a port at least configure for this management VLAN so you always can access to it. But it's quite easy now to, to get this change. Okay. So David is asking, once you have activated the inter-VLAN routing, haven't you eliminated the protection from having the segregated network? Yeah, David, that's, you are totally right. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, that's the reason that we want uh, to add this IP ICLs again, like that's why I couldn't do this webinar without introducing at least IP ICLs because that's uh, that's important. We need to put this firewall into the intervillain uh, network. Yeah. Does the router in the switch supply DHCP or does everything have to be static? Yeah, that's also a good question here. So. That depends on the model. That's another reason for you guys to go to manage switches, fully managed, because here we have the uh, DHCP servers inside the switches. So the switch is able to provide you a different DHCP scope uh, per VLAN. So that's uh, the fully managed switches. We, we have this DHCP scope. So you can create multiple, uh, multiple DHCP uh, pools for, uh, the different villains. Yeah, that's the most expensive one. That's, but it's because we are adding features, as you see, like 
it's not just a switch, it's like switch, router, security, when you add VLA, like DHCP uh, scopes, like you have some server features also added into it. So yeah, <laughs> it's getting like more expensive, but more powerful. If the switch is doing all this routing, how does this help the overall network? Yeah, that helps Eric a lot in terms of the overall network. First, uh, the first thing that you're gonna improve is because remember, for example, let's go back to this one. So remember, if we have like uh, this device that wants to talk to B, and uh, yeah, for example, in this example, if we don't have VLANs, uh, sorry, if we don't have routing enabled or VLANs here in this switch, the first thing is that like every time that this device wants to talk, we'll send a broadcast and this broadcast will go to all the ports. If we have VLANs, we'll only go to the B. So for example, if I have a Wi-Fi network where the, air, where the uh, traffic, it's really important because every packet will uh, affect the per Wi-Fi performance. Yeah, if I don't have VLANs, any communication in the wired network will affect my Wi-Fi network. So that's the first thing that we are gonna improve. The second one is that it's more scalable because you have these routing capabilities and you have now the availability to like uh, move uh, from, for example, these VLANs, like this routing into like a core switch and this put it in, into the access switches. So you have also the scalability, how to move it up. So that's uh, also another point to, to consider in terms of how it helps to do the, all the network performance. If you want to pass only VoIP traffic between two switches, example VLAN 2, would you, would you set it up untagged or the PV Okay, ID so is? for the VoIP, good question. Yeah, we can see here, uh, if we want uh, to pass only VoIP traffic between two switches, so it's only like, if it's only, if it, this link only carries on like one VLAN, we should have this as an access, so it should be untagged and PV82, but if the, the link carries on more than one VLAN, it should be tagged, okay? So if it's just one VLAN, untagged and PV82 will be great, uh, Igor. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, Manu is asking us for the DHCP pool. So yeah, you set up a DHCP in per VLAN setup. So it's uh, in our switches we have uh, into the service area, you have the DHCP uh, service area, and you add into this service area uh, different, uh, like all the different uh, DHCP pools there. So, and you can do it per VLAN. And also you can set up if you want, like all the VLANs has a DHCP server, or only some of the VLANs has a DHCP server. You can set up uh, reservations. You can set up also the DHCP scope. So for example, only, uh, give IP address from 100 to 200. So yeah, it's like lots of different options there like that you can use it. Even now, that's a cool feature that we have in the switches is the DHCP snooping. So you can also uh, identify like which port it's allowed to have a DHCP server. And if the port, uh, if somebody plugs a DHCP server in a port that it's not uh, authorized for a DHCP server, we'll shut down your port. So that's a cool feature also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then David is saying that VLAN ID and the PVID are very challenging concepts. And it would be great to have webinars that would just focus on one concept at a time. Oh. That's something we can definitely do. Can't yeah. Worry, when, Sarah, you want to scale one of those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have those in the upcoming months. Um, we'll, Shavi and I will touch space. And if that's something you guys really want, um, let us know. I think we want to try getting feedback from you guys uh, through Twitter. So if you can tweet uh, us at Netgear, at our Netgear Twitter, and then hashtag Netgear webinar, then we'll get your feedback from there. Uh, we have a few more questions, but we're going to try and wrap this up. I really enjoy, we're really enjoying all these questions, guys. Um, so let's see. Bill, do you have a DHCP server support SSO site? Uh, specific options? Uh, uh, site specific options. Yeah, you can have like on the DHCP server, you can have some uh, DHCP options, but the deal, maybe if you can email us the exact configuration that you want to set it up, 
uh, we can double check it for you because in this case I want to make sure that the options cover exactly what you, you want to set it up here. Um, Eric is asking in your examples aren't you using the a class A TCP slash PIA IP address with the class C subnet? Isn't that? Oh Eric yeah the example as I said it's more um, kind of a easy I will say an overview and we set up the tents and and the um, uh, and the um, uh, type of VLAN so class uh, A VLAN, uh, class A subnet instead of class C however we support something that's called uh, the um, uh, CIRT CSDR sorry that you can mix it so for us we work on the subnet so you can use class A's or class C's and mix it up like between them with uh, the important thing is the mask so yeah you, you, I just like use that one because it was the referring one example but yeah you can you can use um, you can use it as a um, you can use it uh, class, class A or class C for the subnet um, Brian is asking us are the devices connected to the access and target ports given the villain ID from the switch do you, or do you need to manually configure the VLAN ID on the device? Uh, Brian, that's a good question. And the thing that's the PVAD, <laughs> that's what the PVAD does. So when you have the switch here in the switch configuration, you set up, for example, this, let's say that this computer is connected to port number five. So in the port number five, you put PVAD, for example, of the data VLAN, like uh, 10. And this will not send any task packet. This you will not configure anything in your computer. Automatically, when the packet gets into the switch, as the PVAD is the 10, will be on the data VLAN. All right, everyone, take care. Thanks for all the questions. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.